The Mail and Guardian newspaper commemorated the life of one of the founders of the ANC, activist and journalist Saul Plucky, and celebrated the 100th anniversary of his groundbreaking work, Native Life, and a critical gaze by Plucky on the landmark Native Land Act of 1913, and also a distinctive body of work. It ranges widely in its commentary on pressing issues of the day, many persisting in contemporary South Africa today, while vividly narrating the author's journey in South Africa's farmlands and from its industrializing centers to Britain's imperial capital and beyond. A new scholarly work, Saul Plaki's Native Life in South Africa, Past and Present, is edited by Dr. Brian Willen and others, and is a compilation of commentary on the seminal work by South Africa's most talented early 20th century black leader and journalist. Dr. Brian Willen and uh, the grandson of Saul Plaki, Richard Plaki, are here to discuss uh, this new work and the significance of the retelling of Blackie's life in modern day South Africa. And a pleasure to have you with us, uh, Richard and Brian. Welcome. Thank you. And let me compliment you for the work you did over the weekend and uh, also over time producing these works of uh, Plaiki and making sure that uh, they are reprinted and then we can discuss them and read them. Very important fellow, a significant uh, individual in our history. And uh, Richard, you will tell us more about the family history and we will also talk about his work. The Native Land Act of uh, is it 20th June 1913. Brian, let me start with you. It's not, it's not necessarily a defining moment for Saul Plaiki, right? But um, his work came about as a result of that. It, it, it did. Uh, in a way, uh, in terms of, of his life, it probably was quite a, a defining moment because uh, I think a, a lot of what happened subsequently in his life was... Uh, determined by his response to the act. Uh, it, it led him to uh, a deputation to England in, in 1914 as a member of a, a Congress deputation. Um, he actually stayed on in England uh, after the uh, other delegates uh, returned to South Africa. They were recalled by the, the ANC in, in Bloemfontein. But uh, Plyke, he wanted to stay on, and uh, he wanted to stay on because he wanted to write this book, Native Life in South Africa. Uh, which he'd already started writing on the ship on the, the way over. So it was his main motivation, the main purpose of him staying on in the UK was to, was to write that book. And actually the, the writing of the book was a, a big struggle in itself. Uh, he, he had no money. Uh, there were people in London, as in South Africa, who were opposed to what he was doing, who were trying to uh, uh, prevent the book being published. So uh, it was a huge struggle and of course, during the First World War, there were other things on the minds of the British public. They were fighting a war against uh, Germany mm. and, uh, and Germany's allies. So he had a struggle to, uh, to, to secure the attention of the British public, um, but uh, he managed to do so. And uh, he eventually got the book out. Uh, it took him a couple of years, but uh, it had a very big impact once it was published, and uh, both in the UK uh, and also in, in South Africa, and actually then in, uh, in the States as well, because mm. he, he travelled on to the States, and took the book with him, and sold uh, hundreds and hundreds of copies. Now, the interesting thing about Saul Plaki's life, the extent to which I know about it, is that uh, there are there's so many biographical things about his work, right? We're talking about a book as if it's a separate thing, but it's actually about himself yeah. somewhere there, right? Because one would ask now, in 2016, and say, what was going on in 1914, and what is it that made him decide to record the events of his time? It could have been anyone else, mm -hmm. but it, it's him who decided to do that, right? And which says something about himself. What yeah. kind of person was he to have that presence of mind to start recording the events of his time and, of course, produce the work that was a response to the 1913 uh, Natives Land Act, which we still feel the effects of today. Just let's let's go back in time, because he's yeah. he's a self-made man, and um, he became a journalist of his own steam. Mm. Tell me more, Richard. Well, <clears throat> thank you, thank you for this opportunity, Bertim. Um Maybe for me, say, and I think this question is very important because it brings to us the complexity of this character, Saul Blakey because it is easy for a person to say, to look at what he has done from a journalistic perspective and have a view about him from a literary perspective as a novelist too, and, and as a politician in that defragmented way, it's easy to pull out what this person is. But however, I always say that, you know, uh, 
in order to understand the person whom you're speaking about here, yeah, you know, you need to understand his entire ensemble of his life. I mean, yes, he was a journalist. Yes, he was a political activist. He was a novelist. He was an advocate. And that really speaks to the person whom, of, 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 of whom I think so, like he was, you know, a, com a complexity in himself, but who, who, who in my view, really, really sought to, to do the little that you could, you know, in whichever form that you thought possible. And, and, and that's basically what yeah. I think, you know. He, he, had, he had already been a publisher of uh, newspapers, right, by the time he wrote the book. He, he had, he had. He, he had he'd been editor of uh, three newspapers, actually. Yeah. One in, uh, in Kimberley, Coranto yeah. uh, Botswana, and then, sorry, one in Mafeking, and then yeah. two in, in Kimberley. And he had been a, a successful uh, newspaper editor. Mm. Um, and I think you can see elements of that in native life in South Africa. There is a kind of journalistic element to that book and, and what he is doing is pulling together a lot of the work that, that he and, and other you know, colleagues uh, uh, along with him had written in the newspapers. But, but he was not attempting to be scholarly in telling the story about the native land egg, was he? I mean, he was just telling it from a journalist's point of view to say these are the facts and this is the experience of the people on the ground. Right? And I'll come to you in a moment, Richard. Yeah? <laughs> he, was, he was making a case. Yes. He was making a case. The yes. whole point of that book was that it was a, a petition he was appealing to, yes. in the first instance, to the British public yes. Yes. for their support in his campaign against the Land Act and to get them to put pressure on the British imperial government to disallow this act. That was his aim. So the whole thrust of that book uh, and the language that he uses is, is very emotive on mm. one hand. I mean, mm. he has a great kind of elegance of expression. It's a very mm. powerful polemic, but it's very much rooted in the facts, you know. He, 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 he puts forward facts to support the case that, uh, you know, he's putting forward. Um, so it's a mixture of things. It's, sure. a, it's a mixture of making a case uh, and recording what he saw. And, and, and the effects that he warned about from an emotional point of view, some of them we're seeing today, I suppose, and some of the stuff that he predicted that uh, caused the uh, condition of the Africans, in particular in South Africa, to deteriorate over time and leading up to the apartheid uh, era and the tensions that have uh, emerged or emerged in time. And of course, now we live in democratic South Africa, but the impact of 1913 is still there today. Yeah. Now, let's, let's talk about the, uh, the kinds of things that uh, Blackie foresaw or was trying to warn the authorities and the interested parties, British government being one of them, and that still persists today, that you think if they'd paid attention then, it would have changed. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> in my view, really, I think the words, you know, in Native Life, when he says that, you know, ultimately a South African native finds himself a pariah, in the land of his birth. I think it was an indictment for future generations to also have to try to see how they could deal with their present situations then and how this thing would, 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 would continue. Because I'm saying this because even to this point, you know, this day, you know, a pariah status is what South Africans, especially black South Africans, live in this, in this country in a sense that they would have to assimilate it to specific cultures in order for them to realize their full potential. You have to speak English. Uh, you know, you, you, you somehow need to embrace a certain point of lifestyle in order for you to be taken seriously or in any forms. I mean, talk about media. Black journalists still have their own problems mm -hmm. in the land of their birth. Mm -hmm. In the academia, the same thing is happening. In music, across all sectors of existence, you're still having black people needing to justify themselves through the gaze of, you know, Eurocentric culture and customs in order for them to be taken seriously. This is what is happening today. Mm. Well, and let's, let, I want to go back to the takeaway in 2016. What is the main takeaway from the story of Saul Plaghi? I, 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 I think um, Plaghi was a great spokesman and he was a, a great writer. Um, and uh, I, I think, I think it's, it's a mistake to look for two specific lessons yes. uh, from the writings of somebody who was writing, you know, in the, the, the 20, 19, 1920s and the period before that. Um, you know, there are no easy solutions mm. to be found in, in Plyke. But I, I, I feel that, that the main thing is that Plyke is a great sense of inspiration. He provides a great sense of inspiration. Um, he was a great believer in 
uh, in rational discourse. Uh, he, was, uh, he put forward wonderful arguments, very, very elegantly expressed. So uh, I, I think one thing that today, you know, perhaps Pleinke we can go back to uh, is, is his commitment to, 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 to rational discourse, to uh, arguments coming up with a, a solution that people can then buy into. So I, I think that's probably one of the things that I would... Am, know, am I the say. only one who thinks that, you know, or, or maybe amongst the few people who think that there could have been much more said about Blackie as one of the uh, leading figures of his time than we see? And of course, it's uh, people like yourselves, like academics, who have invested time to resuscitate his work and come up with book festivals where he celebrated. But am I exaggerating to think to say that there is much more to Saul Blackie than we have heard or seen? in the public domain. Yes, yes, I think so. But maybe this is, is also an, an opportunity to reflect a little bit on, on the person of, of Brian Will and himself here, because really without Brian, mm. you know, we would not have known about Salt Lake in South Africa. Yes. Here's a person who just comes from, you know, from London and decides that I'm going to bring Saul Plaikie to his people. He's mm. the one who actually generated a little that we know mm. about interest. Well, about Brian, it. and this leads me to the question then. For you personally, I've <laughs> yeah. said in general terms, what does Plaikie mean for you to invest time researching and uh, compiling books about him <laughs> and bringing some of his works to life? Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, let, let me just say, uh, first of all, um, it, it, it was thanks to people like Richard's uh, grandmother, Mrs. Mary Plikey, who was a, a wonderful old lady who's, who's died now, uh, who I was very fortunate to have met, and, and she told me about a lot of the memories that mm. she had of, uh, of, of Sol Plikey mm. and others of, of her generation mm. as well. Mm. Um, but to, to, to try to answer your, you know, your, your, your question, um, I, I, I think what I particularly admire about Plyke is the determination that he showed to rise above the circumstances mm. that he was born mm. into. Uh, there was just an extraordinary level of commitment. And I think as time went on, he felt a, a sense of obligation, a sense of responsibility to represent the interests of his people, whether, whether you were talking about the Baralong mm -hmm. um, or whether in time it was the African people of South Africa as, as a whole. Um, and I think he, I think he realised that he was probably better positioned than most other people. You know, he had these wonderful talents as a, a writer and, and a communicator, mm. and I think he felt an obligation to to make the most of them. So he just kept going. You know, whatever the discouragements, you know, whatever the setbacks that he encountered, both in his personal life and you know, and, and politically. I mean, the 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 period that he lived through. You know, was an awful period politically mm. from the mm. point of view of black South Africans. Mm. You know, there was the Natives Land Act, then there were various other measures of segregation that were introduced. And Plyke fought against that tooth and nail. And I think, you know, he bore witness to what was happening. Mm. Yeah. So I think he left a wonderful archive, you know, a record of of an African view on all of this. So sure. I think it's that record that he's left for today, you know, that's particularly important. Brian, thank you very much, and Richard, much appreciated for joining us and talking about uh, Sol Plaiki, native life in South Africa, and Sol Plaiki's native life, past and present, which is a commentary on the book that he wrote in 2016, but there's more to Sol Plaiki's life than what we've tried to tease out here. And uh, Sol Plaiki living an archive of the historical time that he lived in, as well as writing books that promoted his own culture and strengthen his own language. So we continue with the show in a moment.